this is the the drum I keep hitting, man. Like, let's just not forget that this this isn't just about writing checks to student athletes. This is about giving them opportunities to develop in real ways beyond their sport. What is up, everybody? I'm Adam. That's Sean over there. Special guest, Logan Hiddle. That means this is another episode of the NIL Show. We are season two, episode seven. Joined today by, by Logan Hiddle, who is, you know, every time we talk to, to people in your seat, Logan, the title changes, right? It's like, it's like when you talk to an HR person at a tech company. It's like, oh, I'm the master of culture. Oh, I'm the, the people guru. Like, you're the NIL director at Ohio State. What's your official title? I don't think I've ever known this. Yeah, my official title currently is assistant athletic director for NIL here at Ohio State. So uh, grateful to sit in this seat. Uh, grateful for you all having me on and look forward to the conversation. So, Yeah, this is this is going to be great. You, you have the rare distinction of coming from being a, a student athlete at Ohio State. So you're a, you're a through and through Buckeye. And I, I, I think you got a promotion into this role, right? They had kind of started out with their NIL strategy as, as a little bit of a different position. Is that right? Yeah, that is right. Yep, Adam. So I uh, had the opportunity to obviously be a walk-on student athlete here at Ohio State, um, which is, you know, uh, an experience that I've embraced and has been really grateful for to sit in the seat today, you know, was a janitor to a walk-on. So for me, it was a really unique experience. So grateful for all of those things. But yes, yeah, went from associate director of student athlete development uh, into a director of NIL role and then transitioned into this assistant AD role uh, shortly after. So it's been a fast progression, but the space changes, our needs obviously change here at Ohio State. So, um, always evolving. so I, we, we glazed over something there real quickly. You, you parlayed a janitor role into a walk on position at uh, Ohio State football. We, we got to dive into that. How, how does that happen? Yeah. So for me, you know, I, I wanted to get into sport. Uh, as you all know, getting into sports, it's always about your first opportunity. That's why I tell all of our student athletes. So uh, for me, that was being a, a facility worker at the, the football complex. So I uh, always viewed the opportunity of, you know, taking out trash to get in front of, you know, whether it's coaches, administrators, whatever that is, is a networking opportunity. Um, and then that that parlayed into me being able to walk on and, and be a part of the roster for two years, which also then transitioned me into to these experiences. So I tell everyone it's all about making the most of the role you sit in. And I wouldn't be where I'm at today if it wasn't for those things. So it's literally it's literally the perfect like you are the perfect case study for every student athlete <laughs> right in terms of building their career like what opportunities are in front of you what can i do to make the most of it build relationships build a network out that leads to ultimate opportunities I, I, it's taking every ounce of my being to not make a, a rudy reference but there, <laughs> there's there's strong rudy ties there with just you where you started and where you ended up on the Ohio state football team that's, that's pretty special man yeah, I appreciate it. And I think that that is true. I think that there's opportunity. You just have to seek it out. Uh, I always make jokes with our student athletes of like, I had zero. Uh, my NIL valuation would have been negative 10 probably, but uh, I would have went after waste management. Like that would have been my NIL opportunity just because I think the story and the PR that you could earn from that. So I always encourage student athletes to like think creatively about how, even if you're not a star on your team, right? Think about how you can leverage your story uh, to help a brand really get some good ROI and earned media, which I think is something that's maybe glazed over a little bit in this space, um, is the value in earned media. So that's something that, you know, I always take my unique experience and tell student athletes, there's always something uh, or some story or opportunity to be told, um, which is unique. I'm getting, uh, I'm getting like Tom Brady vibes here too. He was talking about his, his time at Michigan. He's like, look, man, <laughs> you can only deal with what's right in front of you. Just go out and do that like you're you know, in the Super Bowl every single day, whether or not it's taking trash out, taking two snaps at a practice squad, whatever it is, do it with 100%. That, that's awesome, man. You can't bring up Michigan to an Ohio State guy. Adam. What are we doing? What are we doing here? <laughs> I know. He, he, I know. He was different. He's an exception. He's an exception. But yeah, I mean, I agree with that, Adam. I just think that sometimes that's overlooked about the ability to just be really good at what you're doing. Um, and people will notice that, right? Whether it's uh, and I think important leaders, right, understand the value of people being really good at what they do, whether that is a facility worker or a chef or, you know, the AD, right? Like people realize that people embrace their role and, and give their all. And I think that that ultimately creates other opportunities. So just always been my vision, my goal, and ultimately, you know, wouldn't be in this seat if it wouldn't be for those things. So I'm I'm going to gonna jump into probably a, a not a surprising question to those of us who are in it, but maybe surprising question to the, the fan of NIL or maybe the hater of NIL. 
From your experience, obviously sitting in your seat, high profile athletics program, obviously not just football and basketball, uh, women's basketball was fantastic this year, but a, a lot of competitive programs across, what is it, 36 sports. How is your story more common to your student athletes or is it more common to have student athletes who are just getting tossed millions of dollars every single day. Yeah, I think that, you know, we're, we're fortunate to sponsor 36 sports programs, which I believe is the most in the country. So we have over a thousand student athletes. And I think that, you know, from my seat, it, it's explaining those things, right? Like you're going to have student athletes on, on both ends of the spectrum. And that's our job, right, as a university to uh, meet those student athletes where they are, whether it's, you know, a student athlete that has to create their own NIL opportunity by telling their story and, and hustling, which is something that we're grateful to have a lot of high character, you know, motivated student athletes to do. But then you're also going to have some of those student athletes opportunities come to them. Right. And I think that uh, that's the value of, of having a brand in an athletic department like Ohio State is you're going to have, like I said, student athletes on both ends of the spectrum. But my goal is is that whether what no matter what end of the spectrum you're on, you're never going to say that you didn't know how to engage or you didn't have the resources to be successful here. So as I sit in my seat, you know, that's my goal day in and day out. And I think uh, we're blessed to obviously have some of the most high character athletes in the country and, and opportunities come to them because of that. A thousand athletes, by the way, is, is wild. That is a lot of student athletes at one school that Ohio State carries. Just to put it in perspective, on our NIL store, I think we have over 500 Ohio State athletes that are currently live that mm -hmm. have merchandise available uh, on the NIL store. That's more than double any other school has live currently, I believe. I got to go back and check my math on that. But we, by far, Ohio State is our most student athletes. And it's only about half of them. So we got a lot of work cut out for us to get the rest of them on there. But yeah, that's a that's a lot of athletes to deal with. How do you effectively manage all the wants and the needs uh, across the coaches, the students, the administrators, when you're talking about 36 sports, 1,000 athletes, and 36 head coaches, and a lot more assistant coaches? Yeah, great question. I think it's, you know, managing expectations is important, being transparent. Uh, communication is something that, uh, you know, I've, I've been fortunate, I think, to to be – good at i think you have to be you have to be able to understand the wants and the needs of, of coaches and, and teams and student athletes uh but then you can't you know obviously under promise over deliver just because at the end of the day there's only so much we can control from you know the nil director rc so for us it's it's just really making sure that once again they feel supported they feel that you are actually an advocate for them and, and their needs i mean and it looks different right it looks different from a rowing to a baseball to a football to lacrosse so just making sure like i said that you're having those conversations you are obviously actively understanding what it is where they want to be in this landscape whether it's a student athlete or a coach and, and helping them get to that point so it's just a lot of conversations obviously i think each scenario though helps you in the future for whatever comes next even if it's with a different team or a different roster there's not a whole lot of scenarios that we haven't seen at this point which i think helps us navigate our day-to-day -day role here what's one of the wonkiest things that that you feel like you've you've had to deal with i mean i, I feel like in the last six months or so you know, NIL as an industry is starting to kind of stabilize a bit and, and stabilize is relative. But, mm -hmm. you know, we kind of start to see a lot of the same situations happen over and over again. And uh, I remember when you and I were first starting to work together, you're like, look, man, it's, you know, it's different here. And as as a Michigan guy myself, I was like, ah, oh, yeah, here we go. Another Buckeye. Look, we're <laughs> special. You know, and then we started to really dive into the landscape of your athletes and the scope and the size. And, and I was like, oh. It's different there. Uh, that's 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 a lot to manage. What's like one of the the wonkiest things you think you have to deal with, particularly as it relates to just that that scope and scale from somebody who sits in your seat? Yeah. First of all, Sean, make sure you clip that. He did say it's different here. So. <laughs> I think uh, I think you hit the nail on the head, right? It's the scope and it's the the amount of people involved, right? So we're, I mean, to serve a thousand student athletes and thirty six teams, right? We have uh, a large department. You know, I think I think Gene talks about we have five hundred and fifty full time employees across athletics and business advancement. So for me, right, like my, my space is nil. Now I'm fortunate because that space touches a lot of different departments, but. You know, I have to be that liaison and that person to kind of communicate across compliance, trademark and licensing, Learfield. So uh, I think that that's the piece that, you know, goes back to that relationship conversation we talked about earlier, because for me, you know, it's making sure that I maintain that relationship and then I can make sure that those people feel that, you know, their voice, their concern, uh, their needs are heard as well uh, outside of coaches and student athletes. 
to make sure that I'm effectively communicating to make sure that we're obviously all moving in one direction. Because as you can tell, you know, as a, as an external entity, the more cohesive a department is, the easier it makes your life. So for me, uh, you know, that's my, my goal every day, every single day is whether it's student athletes, coaches, or, you know, an external entity is to make it an efficient and effective experience. And, and that's, that's kind of how I operate. And, you know, I'm going to do everything in my power to do that. So it's not always easy, right, to get a process from A to Z. But at the end of the day, you know, it's my job to do that. I'm not sure that there is a position. Uh, the director of athletics obviously touches everyone. And there's some other positions I'm sure that you could probably name, Logan. But there's not many of them that touch literally every piece of the athletic department and outside of the athletic department stretching to campus, agency representation, uh, parents, you literally touch everyone. It's such a vital role. But I'm curious to dive into in the representation side as pertains to agencies. Where does your role fall into that when you have some of those top tier athletes who have reps? How do you work into that equation? Um, so, like you said, you know, it does touch a lot. And, you know, some of the other departments that I didn't talk about is facilities, right? And uh, operate director of ops and, and, you know, legal on campus. And so all of those things. But yeah, from the agency and representative side of things, uh, you know, I, I have conversations with them frequently to understand, you know, what activations are in the pipeline, uh, obviously, to get the contracts that have been uh, completed to make sure that we can review from NCA and eligibility concerns and institutional contract conflicts. Uh, so those conversations are, are ongoing. And that's another relationship that we have to manage, right, to make sure that our student athletes are, are in the best position to succeed, but then to make sure that their representation understand uh, you know, once again, it's, it's a little bit different here, our operations. So, yeah, you might have athletes at, at other places, but I uh, want to make sure that they feel that they have, you know, a champion internally that can help them get things done. So, once again, that looks different, whether you're a rep or a, a, a vendor or whoever it may be. But once again, my job is to make sure that they all feel like their voice is heard and that they have somebody internally that can advocate for them. Here we go again. It's different here. <laughs> you said <laughs> I it. I love it. I know. I love it. I love it. So, you know, when you came into this role at, at Ohio State specifically, it kind of was a blank slate, right? You tackled the challenge head on and things have changed a lot, right? When we look back to July 1st, 2021, you know, schools were either super aggressive or super conservative, but just from, you know, how, how long we've been working together, I've watched kind of y'all's strategy morph and, and adjust a little bit, um, not, not just as legislation and bylaws and things have changed, but, but also if you, as you've seen, you know, what, what works and, and what hasn't worked. What do you think are, are some of the most important things to keep your finger on the pulse of as you're wanting to kind of morph your strategy as you guys go forward? Yeah, I think once again, we're fortunate uh, to, to have the leadership that we do here. So even in my seat, right? So Carrie Hoyt, our executive associate AD that actually oversees NIL at the at the overarching level. And then obviously Gene is really tied in at, at the NCA and, and conference level. That's really helpful for us to understand kind of where we are across the country, what the landscape looks like. Uh, and for us, we're just going to always continue to adjust our, the needs of our student athletes, right? Like whether it's, you know, NIL or student athlete development or development, all of our departments, like the number one goal is the student athlete experience. So for us, uh, we're going to stay in tune to what's maybe, you know, coming down the pipeline and how are we going to be able to shift to better serve our athletes? At the end of the day, that's what it's all about, right? Like no one can sit here and argue that, you know, NIL is about the student athlete. And for us, that's that's what we're going to continue to to put on the forefront of our mind and yeah, we have we have changed our strategy. You know, some things maybe were a little more rigid and, and less flexible in July 1 of 21. And then obviously October 26 of 22 guidance comes out that, you know, provides a little more autonomy externally to, to collectives. And, uh, you know, that was a big adjustment for us because it was kind of a 180 from what they had put out prior to that. So for us, you know, it's it's always about how can we continue to be fluid and flexible because, you know, at a place like Ohio State, you're you're recruiting the top talent. You know, you're trying to stay elite in all 36 sports. <laughs> um, and for us to to do that, right, you have to be nimble. You have to be fluid. Um, but then also, you know, you you have to consider the the input of people across campus and and those types of things too. So there's a lot of balancing. But for us, it's always about starting with the student athletes, their wants and needs uh, to be successful, and then we'll always work backwards from there. Uh, there are things, you know, as we look ahead and and watch all this legislation and stuff you know, happen or these conversations rather happen around the legislation. Obviously the NLRB is talking through stuff as it relates to USC, you know, they're getting closer and closer to, you know, creating an easier pathway for student athletes to be considered as 
employees and, and athletics department considered as an employer, which then would open up, you know, this whole other can of worms around union, unionizing and, and all that kind of stuff. There are things that keep me up at night about the future of NIL. You know, I think we're very much aligned strategically on wanting to create the most opportunity for student athletes to give them, you know, agency over what their future in this ecosystem looks like. But we sit on this side of it. I'm curious for you, like what keeps you up at night around NIL? What are your biggest challenges as you see this all unfolding down the next two or three years? Yeah, I don't even know that I would say, uh, I think obviously there's some things around NIL, but I just think it's it's even the broad scope of athletics, right? It's just, it's understanding like how uh, there's a lot of parallel paths running currently um, and trying to figure out where do they collide, right? So I think the whole model has the potential to look different in two to three years. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, you know, I don't know what that looks like because if I did, I probably wouldn't be sitting in this seat. <laughs> We'd all be uh, sitting on a beach somewhere in Tahiti, right? If we knew yeah. if we had that foresight. Yeah. So I think that, you know, I think there is a lot of change coming and, and hopefully, you know, I think the thing that we have to consider is, you know, once again, what do the student athletes want? Sometimes I think that, that, that that's kind of lost in conversation. You know, obviously we talked about um, what's happening in, in California and those types of things, but uh, I don't always know that, and, and maybe that's on us to not, you know, gather the information from the student athlete and really sit down and explain to them what's happening, right? Like, yeah, I, I think I saw something this morning on Twitter that some student athletes don't even know like what's happening in, in California and what that means for them. And, you know, how do you explain that, right? To, to a thousand eighteen to, to 22 year olds and, and not only just on our campus, but across the country. So uh, those are things that I think you have to consider. And, and, and once again, I think we're consistently evaluating what that looks like, but I don't think anybody knows where it's going. Right. I think that that's why all these conversations are happening. So once again, it's just, you got to try to stay fluid and nimble and, and figure out where it's going. I know speaking for myself, working in the NIL industry, I, I, I'm constantly watching Twitter and all the congressional hearings. And I know myself, I, I find myself confused on like, what the heck is happening? And I'm in this every, every day in, in, mm -hmm. in the professional realm. I can only imagine what it's like for athletes to try to keep up with it. So what do you, what, what do you tell them, Logan? Yeah, I mean, we try to get them information as as we um, once again, you've got to be careful on how you communicate because you don't want to communicate something too early sure. or you know, give conflicting information. So I think that that's where we have to balance on, you know, I, I think that they do a good job, obviously, of staying in tune to, to what's happening. But uh, for us, you know, we have to, to communicate efficiently and, and make sure that they have the information they need to understand what's happening. Uh, once again, Gene does a phenomenal job of, of making sure the whole department is in unison with with what's updating across the country. <clears throat> once again, we're fortunate because he's in a lot of those conversations. Right. Um, that's what makes obviously him, you know, in my mind, the best leader uh, in co collegiate athletics ever. Um, so we're going to definitely miss him. But uh, I think that, that that's what's important is it's, you know, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say I understand it all, right? There's a lot that's happening in the space that, you know, even being early in my career, it's, it's sometimes hard to wrap your head around what all moving parts are, are tied together and where that's going to go. Um, but for us, like I said, it's just making sure that, that they have the information they need to feel, once again, like we're supporting them and that we're preparing them. And, and, Adam you know, touched on it you, earlier, but I, the, the, whole, the whole concept of the blank slate of the NIL director role is just so intriguing to me. Um, here, you, here you jump in and it's really the world is your oyster in terms of what you can do. Obviously, you have a ton of support around you. How much have you leaned on NIL directors around the country? Now, we, we have Tate Gillespie from Kansas on, on our staff now. How much do you compare notes with them and how much are you trying to take from them, but also realizing, look, we can't do some of the same stuff that they're doing. We have our own ways that we want to do stuff. We have to stick to our own process. How, how, how has that worked for you? Yeah, I think that we've been able to, to create kind of a community, right? We have a, a Slack channel, I think of 65 oh, people cool. in similar positions. For us though, it's hard because there's no like standard set of guidance, right? Like at the end of the day, state laws are different. So, you know, I obviously lean on Ben at Florida and, you know, Tate and I talked a lot. Brian Mason at Wisconsin is across the obviously conference. So a great ally, but you know, one, it's a competitive space too. So you don't want to, uh, you know, give out too much or, or show your cards, but at the end of the day, it's helpful to know, Hey, you know, how did you navigate this situation with this vendor? Or, you know, how are you approaching education in this realm? So those are all conversations that, that we have. And I think it's helpful to lean on one another, but also 
you know, something that somebody may be doing in a different state, we might not have the ability to do just via our state law or institutional policy. So uh, it's helpful to have those conversations, but it's, it's also makes it a little more complex because you're like, wow, I'd love to do that, but can't. So I, I think it's, it's interesting looking at just the scope of this role. And, and like you mentioned, you know, it's a competitive space, but it's also a very small community, right? You know, I always tell my students in class that want to go on and be owners or, you know, general managers of, of teams. I'm like, you, you know, depending on the league, you have a better chance of being a state senator than you do a general manager of, of a baseball team. Right. And, you know, when you look at the scope of, we'll just say power five programs across the country, it really is, there's a small group of you. So, you know, that are trying to navigate the space, trying to solve these problems, not from a 60,000 foot view, but really day to day with the athletes. And every time, you know, we chat with NIL directors, I just have to give you guys, you know, props and commend you for, you know, your, your, your willingness to tackle things. The, this is, you know, I'm not, not gassing you up too much, but just the vigor that you have to wake up with every single day to say, I have no idea what's coming down the pipeline, but this is a labor of love because at the end of the day, I care about these student athletes and I want them to be successful in this space. And you know, you talk a lot about the leadership of Gene Smith and he's at, he's on Capitol Hill having some of these conversations. And I, I think he's one of the first that I would say, I feel confident that he actually knows what's going on because he has gone the extra mile to be in these conversations with you all to embrace at least understanding and knowing what NIL is. And, uh, this is my, my shameless plug that Man, if we're if we're having these conversations and asking questions, get some stinking NIL directors on Capitol Hill, man. Like they're the ones that are in it every <laughs> single day with the stakeholders and 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 really the only people that are, I would say, truly representing the voice of the student athletes right now, right? And and you touched on it, which I think is is the massive problem is kids often don't even know what conversation is being had about them and their future. So it's, it's insane thinking about all that you have to tackle on, on, on a day-to-day -day basis. H how do you, like, what, what motivates you just to keep doing it every day and not say, you know what, I'm going back to being a janitor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, those are, those are thoughts that cross a lot. You know, I think that I'm just the type of person that, you know, I like to, to find solutions, right. And I like to make uh, other people's lives easier. I, I also want to be an advocate, like I said, for our student athletes. You know, I am the liaison to a lot of different stakeholders, you know, whether that's the student athletes, whether that's our administration, whether that's you all internally, right, uh, to help, you know, communicate on your behalf. So I, I think that I enjoy being the person that, you know, gets the opportunity to to serve different groups, right? And I think that that my role is crucial to the success of a lot of different people. So uh, I'm also early in my career. And I, I think that understanding that this, like Sean talked about, touches so many different things uh, to understand where do I want to be? How do I want to get there? And, and I think that this seat has allowed me to, you know, exponentially grow. In the last two and a half years, I've been exposed to things that most don't see in 20. So uh, I'm grateful for that. And I think that, you know, it being such a crucial piece of every athletic department, especially to go to a place like Ohio State, uh, I'm just super grateful. And once again, the student athletes are always front of mind. How, how are we going to continue to serve them uh, and stay at the top of the food chain? Logan, uh, very interested to hear you've seen a ton of activation so far, some super creative, some that just makes sense, some that you're directly involved with, with and some that you may have had no involvement and you're just really proud of the athlete for for coming up with that or, or, or coming across that deal. Give me, give me one or two of your favorite activations that you've seen so far that you were just like, that was awesome. Yeah. Uh, right rug is the one that comes to mind a lot. So right rug is a flooring company here headquartered locally, but is a national company. Uh, they've done two back-to-back -back campaigns, uh, two years ago. And then this past year, all female student athletes. So one, I think that that's really, really important uh, to show obviously the the power and the, you know, the ROI that you can get from utilizing student athletes that aren't in football and basketball, which sometimes is a misconception. So they uh, have engaged with 14 of our female student athletes, eight in one campaign and then four in the other. Um, and they just, you know, you don't really see a whole lot about their brand in it, right? They're telling the story of the student athlete. They're talking about how they support women's excellence. And, and I think that that's something that's really, really empowering. Uh, they also have done a great job with the the production. So the commercials are really, really well done. So those are those, those commercials are, are always one of my favorite, you know, the Chipotle activations that we've done have also been really, really cool. Chipotle is one of my favorite brands. So once again, to see them, you know, in our venues to, to really 
take an approach to to tell the story of you know a few years ago they told the story of an individual athlete and included other players past year they incorporated a, a few other athletes but to see the production come together especially with a large national brand has been really really unique and then you know we could talk about the the local brands all day i think that those are just as empowering right because it's it's a brand that's kind of tying themselves to a student athlete uh, to tell their story and to really get their name out in the community. Um, and we see, you know, people argue about ROI all the time. I think there's extreme value in doing both. So they've all been impactful, but those are some of my favorites. I, you know, it's interesting you talk about local companies activating in the NL space. And this was, you must have been reading my mind. This is going to be my, my follow-up question to you. Michelle Meyer, who runs the NIL Network, talks about this a lot, is that there's this you know, insane amount of value now for these local businesses who maybe don't have the six figure dollar amounts in their marketing budgets to activate, you know, at this, you know, crazy national level. But, you know, for those student athletes that have that connection to that, that local brand or company or, you know, the brand or company themselves that that feel passionate or maybe are even in just straight up proximity to a university, there's a lot of opportunity for them to, you know, connect, elevate their brand awareness. And there's a lot of opportunity on the student athlete side as well to, to you know, to, to connect with a brand that, that they love and, and resonate with and be able to capitalize on their likeness. How do you encourage athletes to kind of bridge that gap? Maybe if they don't have that national reach, are there things you guys are doing on campus to help help connect to those local businesses? Yeah, so we we obviously, you know, I'm pretty active and involved with some of those external stakeholders to educate them on how they can engage. I think that that's a piece that sometimes is overlooked. Everyone just assumes that, oh, these businesses have been in marketing for years. They understand how to do this. And it's like, it's not not the case. So <laughs> None uh, of us understand how to do this. <laughs> yeah. So helping them understand how they can activate, you know, I'm going to take it back to our, our first piece is, you know, every student athlete has a story, right? Regardless of how prominent you are on your team, you have a journey to how you got to this seat currently. So, you know, I think it's tapping into those, uh, the people that run marketing or the CEO of these local companies. And, you know, there's some type of story that may resonate with them. Maybe you're from the same area. Maybe the other, maybe the owner of the company was a rower in college or in high school. And like those people, they, the, when you can pull at the heartstrings of, of the people that are making decisions, you know, that's how you get, get opportunities. So educating our student athletes on how to tell their story is really, really important. You know, like I said, I'm a personal example of that. And, and the better you can do that, the more opportunities are going to come from it. So that's not just an NIL, right? Like at the end of the day, when you're sitting down to do a job interview, you got to do the same thing. So that's why we think it's so valuable is because these are skills and you hear it all the time, but these are skills that are going to be able to tr be translated post NIL. So that's kind of how we educate them to go out. You know, once again, the the audience that these local companies are trying to hit, we have 60,000 students on campus at Ohio State. Majority of students follow student athletes because of their celebrity-like status. So if you are a local donut shop, right, like the target audience you want to hit is the followers of a student athlete, regardless of who they are, right? So uh, that's the way we kind of tell student athletes to leverage it. And, and we've seen success in that and, and are going to continue to approach it that way. And we, and we saw it firsthand a couple of weeks ago. You had us out there for your Ohio State career fair and, and NIL expo. And I think what's cool is in years past, like people have been doing career fairs forever where athletes walk around and they can check out, okay, uh, bring my resume, hand it out to a couple of places, meet local, meet local businesses. Now it, it's kind of changed a little bit where, yeah, it's that same concept, but Hopefully those, and I'm sure you had the same thought, hopefully those companies are thinking a little bit about, oh, maybe actually we, there might be an NIL tie here where we can get involved with the athletes. Um, and it's not as, oh, uh, it's a little bit, I don't know, it's not as transactional. There's a little bit more opportunity on both sides more than it used to be. And yeah, no. you guys, you guys do a really good job. You know, we, we see this at Western Kentucky. We saw it, you know, with, with you guys at Ohio State, we see it at Purdue. These NIL directors and, and, and the programs that understand what you mentioned is this is a professional development opportunity. This goes beyond just like, hey, man, let's go out and get you that bag. Like, no, let's let's teach you the skills to activate. And you don't have to wait till you graduate. You can actually activate that today. I can teach you how to do an elevator pitch and then say, go talk to that company and use that right now. And you guys do a really good job of that. Uh, we, we Like Sean said, we saw that firsthand when we were chatting with your student athletes a couple weeks ago. Yeah, well, we appreciate that and appreciate you all making the trip. Like I said, it was it's great to, to have our student athletes obviously see uh, you all's brand and the work that you're doing firsthand. So we appreciate you all. But we've had a lot of stories, too, of the, the reverse, right? Rather than NIL opportunities turning into career opportunities, but career opportunities 
and t- turning into NIL. So, you know, in our right rug campaign last year, a student athlete that was an intern for them actually got placed in their yearly NIL campaign just because of the work that she had done um, and the relationship that they have developed. So once again, it works both ways. And, and we're firm believers that the career or the intersection of career and NIL is extremely important. And, and the networking, right? We've talked about networking how many times already, like the opportunities to get in front of some of these influential people in the community early in your career pays dividends down the road. But Another piece that's missed uh, a lot is is managing those relationships, right? And fostering those relationships and showing up on time and handling your business. You know, those can be, if you don't do that the right way, it can be detrimental. But if you do it the right way, it can obviously be very, very beneficial for, for years to come. Man, for those those that are, are making those decisions at a federal level, this is this is the the drum I keep hitting, man. Like, let's just not forget that this this isn't just about writing checks to student athletes. This is about giving them opportunities to develop in real ways beyond their sport. As we all know, like that ball stops bouncing eventually. Right. And it, you got to be able to have those skills. So I know we talked about, you know, nobody has an ability to, to look into a crystal ball, but five years from now, you know, where, where, where do you think we're, we're going to land in this landscape five years from now? Oh, it's a loaded question. I think I'm getting a call. I think I'm probably gonna have to... <laughs> yeah, and that's time. <laughs> One of my students are calling. You know, I think there's so many things like I talked about earlier that are running in parallel. The the rev share conversations. I I personally, once again, uh, disclaimer. I have no idea, but personal opinion. I think that at some point that's gonna have to happen. Uh, just with obviously the media rights deals and things that are happening. I think that 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 will become part of our landscape. Now, I think that that can happen without employee status, in my opinion, which is very, very crucial and important to, to keep in the collegiate athletics landscape and model. So I think that that's a direction it'll go. Uh, NIL will not go away, right? Regardless if there's rev sharing, in my opinion, there will still be the ability to go out and do individual endorsement deals. So I think maybe it becomes even more important on you know the infrastructure that universities have to do that and capitalize on it. But once again, I don't know. I don't know that anybody knows. And you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's really important that we keep you know, what's important in mind as we try to navigate these conversations and, and keep the right people in the room to make sure that, once again, people that are, are actually on the ground understanding, you know, it can look a lot different at 30,000 feet than where it actually does on the ground. So just understanding mm-hmm. that, you know, theoretically, this is how it happens and works might not always be how it happens and works when you're when you're actually working on the ground. A hundred percent. Last question for you, Logan, and I would say the most important question of the day. Uh-oh. Logan Hiddle today, not, you know, Ohio State football stud Logan Hiddle. I don't know Logan, that guy. <laughs> Logan Hiddle today. What what's your your ideal dream NIL restaurant deal? Who are you signing with today? Wow, that is a tough question. I did not see that one coming. I like <laughs> dream restaurant deal. Um Chipotle is just too easy of an answer, so I'm not gonna go with that. Um, I respect we have- it. Yeah, we have a, a local restaurant called Forno. So when you all are back in town, we'll have to to hit it up. But uh, it's like an Italian spot has pizza, pasta, uh, obviously drinks. You know, so so I think that that's a spot that I would be going after pretty hard. It's local too, so you know. I probably love it. Think about it though. I should have done a national chain because if I'm not <laughs> in Columbus, I wouldn't. Be there. But yeah, that's probably where I would go. I love it. You heard it here first. Forno's, you know where to find him. Local NIL activation. Get your pasta, get your pizza, game day ready, right? Carbo load, get it ready I'll to go. To run that through Ohio ethics law, though. I don't know if I can be getting NIL deals. So I'm sure <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Awesome, man. Logan, I, again, just have, have such respect for what you guys are doing at, over there at Ohio State University. I think you're doing great work on behalf of your student athletes. Excited to see, you know, where our partnership and, and, uh, just your, your whole program continues to go. This has been a fantastic conversation. Really grateful for you taking the time. Once again, everybody, I'm Adam. That's Sean. This has been another episode of the NIO show. We will see you guys next time.